Amen. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm just, I'm so grateful for Addison. Uh, I was, that was my kind of first role in ministry, was in student ministry. And I was 23 years old and I had, uh, I was granted the privilege to uh, be the student pastor for 250 students or so uh, at a large church here locally. And uh, it was, you know, almost a, a room full of of students like this and just, you know, 12 year olds staring at you when you're teaching them the Bible. Man, what a way to get your chops in ministry. So I'm just, uh, I'm just thankful for Addison and the great maturity that he has uh, in that role because when I was 23, I was not ready for it. So uh, jump on into student ministry is a great place to serve. You get to see a lot of life change, a lot of transformation in those students' lives in such a critical, critical time for them. So before we begin our time in the Word, I want to pray for the Asian American community this, this week. Uh, this has been uh, just a, a tough week for them. They've experienced a tragedy in, in Atlanta, and uh, we have several Asian Americans who are part of our church family here at Citadel Square. And we also uh, have the Chinese Church of Charleston that meets in our space here. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. But the, the Chinese church uh, meets in the chapel, which is kind of in that part of the building. And so uh, they meet in our space. And I reached out to, to one of their leaders, and he asked us to pray for a few things specifically this morning. And he, he mentioned these things. He said the families of the victims. He said the strength for the Asian community, as many are alarmed over increased hostility toward the Asian community. And then to fix our eyes on the Lord as we grieve with those who are grieving and love our Asian neighbors well. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we thank you, God, that we, uh, we are created in your image. And uh, no matter what the, the pigmentation of our skin is or the dialect of our culture, God, we are created in your image. And Father, we pray for the families of these victims who endured these tragic events this week. We pray that you would give them uh, a refuge and a peace and a comfort in this season like they've never known before. God, we pray that you would strengthen the Asian community. God, as we find uh, rest and and comfort in you alone, we also uh, find, find comfort in in our brothers and sisters, and we pray that they would do so, that they would, um, they, would, they would be with one another and be able to encourage one another. And pray that, um, God, as, as we interact with our Asian American friends, our Asian American brother and sisters, God, that we would be sensitive to this season. God, you would tear down any barriers or, God, just any... Uh, any unawareness that we have about lack of sensitivity in our hearts and pray that we would be able to love our Asian neighbors well in this season. God, we give you thanks for them and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. All right, so turn in your Bible. I love hearing those pages, the Bible's there in front of you. Turn in your Bible to Revelation Turn to Revelation. I'm not going to be preaching from Revelation. Some of y'all looking at looking up at me pretty weird because Tim already told you where I'm going to be preaching from, right? So uh, I'm not going to be preaching from Revelation, but I figured it would be a good reference point because we've been there for the last several weeks. If you're just joining us, we're taking a couple weeks of a break from Revelation where we've been working through. But Jude is the book right before the book of Revelation, and so we're going to be in those last two verses of Jude and. I know what you're thinking. Steve grew a beard and got a lot better looking in just a week. But no, my friends. No, 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 no. I'm not Steve. My name is AJ. I'm one of the pastors here at Citadel Square. I'm the other bald one. And uh, I say that because almost every Sunday with the masks, you know, people just see me as another bald, tall head, right? That sits up here and is a pastor. And so I get props on the sermon every week. 
And I just say, thank you. What a powerful text it was. <laughs> thank you, my friend. I do not correct any of you. So if you give me props on the sermon three weeks from now, I'm just going to receive that. Okay? And uh, I, I, I just, I'm not going to correct you. So I think it's a win-win. You know, it, it, it uh, I, I take your compliment and it keeps Steve humble and I don't tell him about it. And so it's, you know, win-win for all of us. So uh, we're happy that you're here, uh, like Steve mentioned, out of the rain, out of the cold uh, here. Or, and we're happy that you're joining us online. We are, are so pleased that you guys are with us joining us this morning. Uh, So we will be in the book of Jude and we'll land in that prayer at the end of the book. The doxology is what it's referred to in verses 24 and 25. And Jude is just one chapter long. So it's often referred to uh, not as Jude 1, 24 and 25, but just Jude 24 and 25 or Jude verses 24 and 25. And so uh, we're going to dive deep into the context before we get going and reading our verse. So just keep your finger there in Jude. Uh, yeah, you ready? You guys ready? Deep dive coming. No more pleasantries. No more jokes. All right. Look at this face. No more jokes. Okay. Um, I'm serious, guys. No, I'm not serious. You know I'm gonna throw. I'm gonna throw some jokes out there. But let's get going. Okay. Um, the book of Jude was written by Jude. Gets his namesake for from its author. Okay. Half brother of Jesus. He's, uh, how do we know this? In Matthew 13, 55, he's referred to in the family of Jesus. He's got the name Judas in that verse, okay? Good, good, uh, good name change by him, I would say. He abbreviated it, took the, took the shortened name. I know about name abbreviations. Mine makes zero sense. My, na- my initials are not AJ, they are JA. That's a different story for a different time. He introduces himself as a servant of Jesus, And the brother of James there in the greeting in verse 1 in Jude, he writes as a pastor to fellow Christians and shares the purpose of the letter. So you get get this thesis statement in the letter right here in verse 3. He says this, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you appealing to you to contend for the faith. That was once for all delivered to the saints. I hope you notice my inflection on the word contend. Did you see it there? That's what this letter is all about. Contending for the faith. Jude refers to Christians, to the Christians he's writing to, as those who are called, loved, and kept throughout the book. He's calling those believers to arms as they contend for their faith. That word in some translations has an intensifier. It says earnestly contend. How do we know that? They get that intensifier from the Greek prefix epi. That is there. And then the word for contend is where we get our words agony or agonize. He's communicating that there is turmoil present in him Jude the pastor to these people because though because of those who have crept in and perverted the grace of God that we see him mention in verse 4 there in your bible these teachers have come in and began teaching a gospel different from the true good news of Jesus he's contending against these apostates or false teachers When I think about contending, what comes to mind for you? Of course, for me, if you know me at all, I think about a sport, right? So I think about a sport. Uh, I think about some kind of sport that gets the lungs just burning, gets the lactic acid going. Kind of different than any other sport where you got to push through, you got to endure. And the sport that most... Uh, it brings that to mind, you know, just most easily, I would say, for me that I've actually participated in was high school wrestling. It's a sport that almost prepares you, I feel like, for military. It's, it's crazy. It's, a, you know, when I went out for wrestling, you know, when I, when I went out for football, baseball, there were cuts. You know, you would get cut. The team would get dwindled down to, you know, to 60 kids for football, 15 for wrestling. First day of wrestling practice, they say, don't worry about it. No cuts. We're like, okay, that's cool. 
And uh, they're like, the conditioning will make you cut yourself. You will, you will be cut from the team, but based on the conditioning. It's that hard, okay? So I see this same level of contending nowadays when I watch the UFC, mixed martial arts, right? You can see it on a person's face when they simply don't want to contend, when they simply don't want to be in there anymore, when they don't want to be in the cage anymore with that other person that's across the cage from them. They quit without actually throwing in the towel. To be able to contend, every MMA fighter has to have one thing. What is it? Is it the gloves? You got to have gloves. No, no, it's not the gloves. Is it the walkout song? You got to have music, but you know, well, some don't, but it's not the music. Is it the shorts? Although they do wear shorts, please wear shorts, right, when you fight. It's not the shorts. It's not even the perfect game plan for their opponents. It's not even the the best trainer or coach in your life has ever started to crumble. And maybe that is a current reality for you today. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your integrity. Maybe it's your family or your academic pursuits or your career. Then you know just how important hope is. You see, Jude is talking about hope for something slightly different. He's talking about saying we need to contend for a supreme part of our lives. All those other integral part of our lives are very important to us. But he's saying there's a supreme thing in your life that you must contend for that informs all those other areas. He says we must contend for our faith, for the truth of the gospel of grace. In the first 16 verses of Jude's letter, he tells us, his reader, why they should contend for the faith. And then in the last several verses of the letter, he tells us how to contend earnestly. So he starts with the why and then instructs them on the how. And we find this beautiful doxology at the end of the book. A doxology is a pause, a song, a hymn, a prayer to glorify the name of God. And here is the doxology from Jude and our text today. It says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Would you all read that with me as we read it one more time? We're going to read it together. You ready? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So off the heels of just looking at our text, let me pose a question that I think you may want to write down or jot down in the notes app of your phone if you're a note taker with us, and it's this. If God is not able, then what hope is there? If God is not able, then what hope is there? So here we have a book about earnestly contending for the faith, and it finishes with this text. These verses are not an appendix to the preceding 23 verses. No, they are not the pre-populated signature that pops up in your email automatically sent from my iPhone, right? These aren't, they aren't that kind of salutation. These verses are actually the climactic point of this letter. A lot of times we'll see that happen in the middle of a book, in the middle of a movie, in the middle of a biblical letter. But here it happens at the end. The climactic point of this letter here at the end in verses 24 and 25. This doxology has been a bedrock of my prayer life. Many of 
uh, the services, like I mentioned, I, I did student ministry for a long time. Um, many of the services that I led, we would recite this prayer as our doxology, as our benediction at the end. It's, it's just been a prayer for me that has uh, gripped me for a, quite a long time. Some even refer to it as, as the most beautiful prayer in the New Testament, as the most beautiful doxology in all of the New Testament. And so we start with our text there saying, Now to him. I love this phrase. I love this phrase in the Bible. Is there a question, even a slight doubt, about who the him in this phrase is? Is there even one question that pops into your mind about who that could possibly be? One theologian says, when you think about God, what comes to mind is the most important thing about you. When you see that now to him, there's no question about who that him in this text is. And there never is and there never should be when we read the Bible or when the Bible gets into us and when we allow the Bible to read us. There should never be a question about who the central character of the Bible is. Or even when you or, or I look at our own lives, when we think about our own purpose and vision for our own lives, our own calling, our own meaning for our own lives. They're not our own. They're his. He's the central character of our lives. It should all point to him. It's all about him. It's all for him. And it's said now to him. I love the way we start here. A few other New Testament doxologies that you might be familiar with come from Romans and Ephesians. There's one in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 that starts like this. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. Romans 16, 25 through 27 says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. This is about him. And this him is God. And now we're going to learn a few things about who this him in our text is. If you're taking notes, you want to write down the two major points of the passage here. It's that God, number one, God is able. God is able. And number two, God is glorious. So we see right after now to him, it says, who is able? Now to him who is able. So these apostates, these false teachers who've come in, brought in a message that could be, that could potential, potentially stumble, cause these people to stumble. But Jude says, they are no match for God. God is able. You see, in the Ephesians doxology, Paul gives praise to God who is able to do far more than we could ever ask or even dream of. He is the God whose grace no man has ever exhausted and on whom no one can claim ever being too much. Here Jude offers his praise to the God who is able. So what do you do with this? Uh-oh, you're thinking application already? That We're getting to lunch quick, right? Not yet. I'm just going to throw an application right at the beginning, right in the middle here. All right, application already. Yes, sir. You rest in this. You rest in this. Now to him who is able, you can rest in it. He is big, I am not. Right? He is God and I am not. He is able when I cannot. Remember, these are people who are contending for the faith. What's Jude doing? He's giving them hope. No matter where you're at in life, God is is the central character who gives us hope. Praying with my daughters around bedtime, we 
have enacted some uh, some application of this of this passage to just the tendency is to begin by saying, "All right, what are we praying for? What are we praying for tonight?" That Greta would have good dreams. That's that's her go-to. That's my middle daughter. She's ready to go. She wants to have good dreams. So I usually set it with a little parameter there to say, "All right, we've got to pray tonight." And we're not going to ask God for anything. Not that it's bad to ask God for stuff. We're just going to pray tonight. And we're going to pray about who God is. We're going to pray about God's character. We're going to pray about what he's done. We're not going to pray by asking God for anything. We can do that tomorrow, girls. And so it just like, I I can see my girls like melting. They're like, it's like a rewiring of their brain. Because that's how we're wired. We're just wired to ask God for stuff. But God has wired us for worship. He's wired us for worship. And we can praise him through just telling him who he is, what he's done, what kind of character he has. So what particular thing is Jude zeroing in on that only God can do? Glad you asked. Let's look at the text and see. He's going to tell us. That God, this God, this him, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. All right. So God can keep us from stumbling here on earth. Here Jude is talking about the faith. Remember he's talking about contending for the faith. With the word stumbling here, it means that God keeps us from falling into sin and error That could lead us to falling away from the faith. And he says, you are kept safe and faithful in the hands of the almighty God. But how does he do it? Can we keep ourselves? Right? Can we go in and out of salvation, ping-ponging back and forth based on our efforts or works? That's a big debate. Let's check out. Some text. See, there's one important one here. Just up a few verses. It says in Jude 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. You, you could read that and say, oh, he's telling us, build yourselves up, right? Build yourselves up. Keep yourself. But there's some sort of interesting paradox here if you actually look at the text. What does it say? Waiting for the mercy that comes from who? Of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. It's interesting the way it's written. And then if you just think about the context of what we're doing here. That's in verse 20 and 21. We're down in verse 24 and 25, and it says what? The God, him who is able to keep you from stumbling. So he keeps us from stumbling, and we're encouraged to keep ourselves, right? And we're encouraged to build ourselves up, but it all stems from this mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's another one. It's in 2 Peter 1.10. I'm going to give you guys a second. I'm, I'm a fast talker. Steve is much more of a slow talker than I am. And he gives you guys ample time to turn in the Bible. And I need to slow down. I'm sorry, guys. Please, my forgiveness. It, I, need, I need the forgiveness on that one. Steve's just much more patient than I am. I'm like, fast talker, go, go, go. I said 2 Peter 1.10. I'll let you turn there. When you get it, say got it for me so I know you're still awake and tracking along on this rainy morning. All right, all right, all right. Here we go. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. It's easy to to look at that and say, okay, we we got to practice these things, right? We got to be diligent. Who called you? Who elected you? Who loved you when you were unlovable? Who called you into the love of God? God himself through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
chose us before the foundation of the earth. Philippians, this is a famous one, Philippians 2, turn there. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Here's another one. That was fun. When you get it, say, got it. Let's do that again. There we go. You guys can tell I used to preach to 12 to 18-year-olds. Can't you? Can't you? Y'all can smile. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's where most people end it, right? But keep reading. Here we go. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Right? God doing the work here empowers us to do this work. He's the one who keeps us even when we can't keep ourselves. So which is it? Because he is working in me, I can work it out. Because he's working in me. Because he's already at work in me. Because he was, he was at work in me before I ever knew him. He was ordaining and aligning things in my life. And I'm thankful for that. Are you amazed that you're a Christian here? If you're, if you're a believer, if you've trusted in Christ today, are you amazed at that? If you, if you haven't trusted in Christ, if you're exploring Christianity, if you're checking us out, seeing what church is about, wanting to go to the church that doesn't have an open lobby that's closed, welcome. We're doing some construction. We're glad you guys are here. But if you're a Christian, are you amazed that you're a Christian? I'm amazed that God saved a 19-year-old boy named A.J. Rankin. I'm amazed at that fact because I knew me. I knew who I was. And he did so before the foundation of the earth. Are you amazed that you're still a Christian? I'm amazed that God has kept A.J. A. Rankin a Christian these past 16 years. I'm amazed at that fact because I still know me. And God knows me. Because I tell you this, friends, if I could lose my salvation on my deeds, my thoughts, my motivations, my intentions, I would have by now. We need a God who can keep us. And we are safe in his hand. Listen to these words from John chapter 10. You may know them if you've been around church or navigated the Bible for any period of time. It says this, I give them eternal life. These are Jesus' words. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, here's the second part. Here's the second thing God's able to do. He's able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. God's able to present sinners blameless. AJ, this seems like another conflicting thing here. We've got to keep ourselves somehow, but it's God who's keeping us, Right? We've, we know we're sinners, but we're declared blameless before the presence of God. That seems like friction. Seems like a contradiction of sorts. No, 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 friends. No contradiction here. Listen to these words from Romans chapter 5. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. See, this is a legal thing that's happening here before, as we stand blameless before the presence of his glory. Justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if 
while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. If you are a Christian, if you have trusted in Christ, if God has given you new life in Christ, if you've been born again, if you're a new creation in him, you are the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5 paints this picture of God washing his bride with the water of the word. It's a famous marriage passage as well as marriage is the perfect picture of what Christ does with his bride, the church. It's our, it's our only glimpse at that in our earthly uh, story. And so when a groom looks at his bride in the white dress, there's, there's that picture. We often look at the groom to, to look back. One of my favorite things to do, to see how he looks at his bride. I don't know if when you're at a wedding, I just officiated one last weekend, if, you, if what comes to mind for you is that that's the way in which Jesus looks at me. That's the way Jesus looks at his church. Not with stain and, and blemish, but washed clean by his blood. Blameless before him. I love this the way in which this is said. You see, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. The God who can keep you from stumbling down here on earth, get this, he can make us stand up there in heaven. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That God, the God who can keep us from stumbling on earth can present us, make us stand in heaven. I love the Bible in this way. I just love that God inspired his inerrant word to be written so beautifully that it is almost comical. It's so poetic here in Jude. That, that, that image there, that image that Jude is painting poetically. He continues as he says, before the presence of his glory with great joy. We're going to get some more into, into glory here in a minute, but with great joy. This is what heaven will be like. Now, I know I preached a while ago about clapping. Y'all almost had it, I heard, on that first song, right? It was like 30 seconds. We're starting to clap after songs. Right? That's good. That's good. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. We're loosening up a little bit, right? Even this half-heartedly clap right now is awesome. Y'all better loosen up a little bit because I'm telling you, I think heaven is going to be joyous. It's going to be joyful. It is going to be joyful. It might even be a little bit loud. Shocker, I know. It might even be a little bit loud. Because we have great joy in this text. There's a God that can keep us from falling into snares and traps on earth. And there's a God that with all my stain, all my sin, all my muck that I fall into on my own, he can present me blameless before the throne of God. I'm going to have great joy about that all the rest of my days on this earth and all the rest of my days for eternity. Now I know things are gonna be thrown at me. I'm gonna be down in valleys. I'm gonna go through hard times and so are you. But we have a God that can keep us from ultimately stumbling, from ultimately falling. And we have a God that can present us blameless. That's the joy of the presented, but there's a joy of the presenter here as well. There's great joy and it's reciprocal. You see, God is joyful that his plan that he had before the foundation of the earth, it's unfolded. And he's not surprised. He's not surprised one bit. Because he's the redeemer. 
He's our Savior, as we'll see here in just a second. And through this series of events, God gets maximum glory. You see, verse 24 is about what God does for you and I. And verse 25 lets you know that what God does for you isn't about you. That's, that's a shocker, I know. And it, and it hurts sometimes when you read the Bible and you realize, right, that you're not the Spider-Man of this, of this text, that you're not the Iron Man of this text, that you're not whatever Marvel guy is your favorite guy, okay? You're not the central character. You're not the Thor. I could go on all day. That's, that's not you. Now to him, right? This book is about God. It's about God. And it says, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, God here is worthy of exclusive praise. There's one God. That's the, that's the anthem of the first five books of the Bible. Right? Deuteronomy 6, 4, I believe, to the one God. Right? First Timothy 5 says that although there are three persons of the Trinity, that we have one God. And God is worthy of this type of exclusive praise because it's God who sent Jesus to the cross. God who sent Jesus here. And God <clears throat> is our Savior. God is our Redeemer. And it's through Jesus our Lord that we, would that we would see all glory, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. These words are big. They're grand words, right? They're a little bit hard to fathom. I've got, I live in a, in a, in a town in, in Charleston here where I've got a, I've got a unique uh, look at the night sky. But way back behind my neighborhood is a creek. So there's not really anything there. And then way over on this side of my neighborhood is all owned by the Navy. So there's like no busyness of streets on either side. So when you can stand up in my backyard at night, you get to see the stars, almost like you're out in the mountains. It's pretty incredible for that to happen in the Tri-County area. And it's just one of those reminders. It's a Romans 1 type reminder that God's fingerprint is all around us, all around us. And we, like we prayed when we prayed for the Asian community, we are created in his image. Not all dogs go to heaven, right? We, us people, are created in his image. We have a soul, we have a spirit, God has created us with a heart and we're created in his image. And this is incredible to think about. This is, a, this is a verse from a psalm that just kind of tries to put bookends on this. And it's, it's, it's the psalmist's attempt and it comes up short even. But he puts, he puts words to how these four words make us feel. God, great is the Lord, it says in Psalm 145, verse 3, and highly to be praised. And his greatness is, does anyone know? Unsearchable. Unsearchable. Do you see what's happening here? Remember where we started. These people are contending for the faith. And what is what is Jude telling them? Is he telling them, hey guys, go get, go get this sort of armor, get equipped theologically in this class, do this, do that, do this, do that. He gives them a little bit of why and how. 
right? From verses 1 to 23. But then he ends with the climactic point, and it's all about God. It's all about our glorious God, whose greatness is unsearchable. And then he ends like this. He says, before all time and now and forever. One theologian says that this is the most completely succinct phrase when describing the Alpha, the Omega, the before, the before Genesis 1 world and the eternity. We, don't, we can't even fathom the lost world of, of before Genesis 1, can we? And we can't even fathom eternity. And here, Jude puts that into context. He, he says, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory. Be these unsearchable things about God, that we, the God whom we should worship. He says, do this and do it before all time and now and forever. God is worthy of that kind of praise forever. Before I was even created, before I was even born, God was still worthy of praise. Jesus has always been plan A. He wasn't plan B. Oh, people messed up, need, to, need, a, need a rescue plan. Before Jesus even showed up on the scene, God was worthy of our praise. And he was worthy before all time and now and forever. And then it ends with this one word. Amen. Or amen. Amen has been called the best known word in human speech. Did you know that? That's what it's been called. To say amen confirms a statement by someone else. That's why whenever we're praying, we say, yes, let that be. Let that be so. Amen. I'm confirming that with you. Let it be so is really what, exactly what it means. And so one wonders here. When we end this with amen, it should cause us to go back and think through what we just looked at, what we just read, what we just heard that we're saying, let it be so. God, let you reign over my entire life. Every crack in my life, every area that's a valley in my life, reign over that, God. Reign over all of the times where I'm praising you, God. All the mountain peaks, all the valleys. Reign over that. Because you're going to be able to keep me. You're going to be able to keep me and you're going to be able to present me. And you're worthy of that praise, God. You're worthy of that. So, we've got people contending for the faith. And how do we know, back from our opener, how do we know when... Every fighter knows when they're done, when they no longer have hope of winning. Well, if you don't have these two verses in the book of Jude, I would challenge you guys that you are not going to contend very well. You're not going to contend very well. And like I said earlier, these verses have been a bedrock prayer for me in my life. Not everything is always on the trajectory upward for us, is it? There are, there are different valleys that we're going to go through, different fights in our life that we're going to have to, to struggle with. And the supreme fight of the fight for our faith, the fight for truth, prepares us and informs all those other little areas in our life. So if God is not able, then what hope is there, my friends? And not just to know God, a God who is able. Not just to know about a God who is able, right? Not just to know some mere facts about him. Not to know that's the God and he is able. 
Not just to know that. I know facts about George Washington, right? I know facts about Jackie Robinson. I know facts about Steve Jobs. But I don't know them and they don't know me. I never knew any of them. You see, there's something different here. I can know a God who can keep me. I can know a God who can present me. And God can know me. You see, this God can keep you. He can keep me when we can't keep ourselves. How do we know this? Number one, because God's word tells us so. It tells us so. And number two, we know this because we can know him. Because we can know him personally. And he can know us. You can know him. You can know God through Jesus Christ our Lord, our Savior today. You can be kept by him forever today. You can have hope that there is an eternity, that there is a forever today. God is able, God is glorious, and there is hope. Let me read our text one more time. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. See, friends, God is able, he's glorious, and there's hope only in him. He can keep you, he can keep me, even when we can't keep ourselves. My prayer is that you would put your trust in him today, no matter where you're at in your Christian journey, is that you would put your faith deeply and solely in Jesus, who is worthy of our praise. And if you haven't come to know Christ yet. We'd love to talk more with you about it. We'd love to, to explore what Christianity truly means. And so again, God is able, God is glorious, and there's hope in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you equip us God, with your word, you equip us with you. You give us, God, your spirit. And we're able, as you have worked in us, God, we're able to work these things out now because we're empowered by you. And so, Father, I pray that we would do so. I pray that we would... We would keep ourselves, but we're keeping ourselves from stumbling, God, because you are keeping us from stumbling. Father, you are the one who presents us blameless, and God, we're thankful for that. We're eternally thankful for that, and Father, I pray that this, would, this text would be a, a, a pillar for us. It would be something that we can go back to when we need hope when we're struggling, when we're down, when we just need to be reminded of who you are, that we can know you personally, and we can know, God, the unsearchable ends of your greatness and your glory. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.